Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I introduce the star of the evening, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Monica Bilbia Panjevic. I'm the artistic director of the Kaleidoscope, and I'm also going to be your host for the night. And before Mr. Arvena joins us on stage, I want to walk you through the program because it's going to be divided in three parts. First part is Mr. Arvena's presentation. The second part is the talk between the two of us. And the third part, I think it's very important for you, is the Q&A that will happen around 8.30, 45, I don't know. But what is important is there's a lot of you and we cannot take Q&A in real time. So I would ask you to write your questions down. We're going to collect them and the lucky winners will get their questions answered. Uh, so that's for from me, and I would like to invite Mr. Ravena, our star of the evening, to join me. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, so uh, when I first said, let's bring one architect, only one person, to the region. Uh, everybody said, one person for week of architecture. One architect, are you sure? <laughs> I would ask the guys from the technical direction to just switch on the lights for me, please. Wow. Yeah. A lot of people came. And a lot of people came to listen to you. So uh, without much further ado, the floor is yours, and I'll see you later. Thank you. So uh, I'm very honored and grateful to be here, first time in Serbia, uh, for the hospitality. And I have to confess that I'm also surprised for this uh, audience. And uh, I know it's going to be not a lot, a lot of time for the questions and answers, but I hope that with the presentation I can answer some of them before you write them down. Myself will also have three parts. Uh, one where I will share some of our latest projects and um, try to show what is our approach to design, um, what uh, matters in those uh, as design strategies, because those operations, those tools, are the ones that then we bring to social housing, which is the most difficult of the questions. So you better have sharp tools to go into the social housing that because it's a difficult question requires professional quality, not professional charity. And that social housing with all the constraints, with all the difficulties, and sometimes it may go, I may go a little bit nerdy with details, but details and constraints matter. We'll then go to the third part, which is the housing crisis, if not solved, may lead to a type of crisis that is social, political, and human, that is much more complicated. Unfortunately, we're witnessing that type of crisis in Latin America in a, in a very violent way. Uh, and I may show some excerpts, some clips from movies that explain the phenomenon. I know it's not necessarily the case here. But again, it shows the consequences of not addressing some of the issues uh, early enough. So, that being said, this is not a method, I mean, or a formula. It's just what has proved to be useful for us to start a project. X equal question mark. That means that X that we don't want to know is the form of the project. We don't want to want too soon what the project will look like because then projects become an excuse. You just are waiting for somebody to be able to uh, develop your creative agenda. If you postpone wanting until you have charged the question, then you have more chances that your answers are going to be pertinent, relevant, and actually have some impact, hopefully. So, 
it may start as a very blurry, uh, uncertain approach where you write down the main forces that may inform the form of a project. So this is the case for the, just could have been any project, the Innovation Center at the, in Santiago, where you, you already begin to see use, program, security, the character, the environment, and then some architectural operations that may address those issues. Some of those issues are very concrete, me measurable, the constraints, the budget, the time frame, the legal, but some of them are intangible, like the character. So all of them form that equation that the design then has to address. So as you see, it, it moves in both directions. Sometimes you add more uh, aspects that need to be addressed. Sometimes you take out, because you understood they're going to be taken care by other of them. So this could, is how the, let's say, the initial brief that we ourselves built, we may receive a brief from the client, the program, the budget, the use, but that's it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. The real brief has to take care of things that maybe the client is unable to address, the city, the environment, the fears that you feel, uh, or the, the expectations, the desires by other people. So this is what we try to do. Once you have formed or formulated the question, only then we jump into the answer, and hopefully it's as simple as this. Something that is self-explanatory, and once you understand the rule, even the builder can follow up, so it, it acquires some resistance to stand the test of time. In the case of the Innovation Center in Santiago, Santiago is a semi-desertic environment, when you can, you can more or less guess, Innovation Center, meaning into the future, equal glass, equal contemporary, equal shiny. And I know uh, that we had lost the competition. It was a competition that narrowed down until the end. We were just two finalists. And the other project uh, was a glass building that for the jury was the equivalent of innovation into the future. And this is how Santiago looks like. Actually, maybe the people that were financing expect something like that. But we knew that doing a glass building in an environment like Santiago is an environmental disaster. It requires 120 kilowatts per square meter per year in air conditioning. So we didn't go, want, want to go that path. We thought it was irresponsible, even at the risk of losing the competition. We may talk about later, something happened along the way, lucky us. Uh, but what we did was to turn the conventional office plan inside out. What you normally have, let me go backwards, is a transparent perimeter with an opaque core where stairs, shafts, elevators are. So a nutshell that is opaque, and then a transparent perimeter. Well, that in theory, because in practice, what you maybe can see there, it's impossible to work when you have this glare on a, a curtain wall facade. So you end up having curtains inside to protect for the, uh, too much the uh, overdose of light that you get. So you need to calibrate that. So that's why we turn that plan inside out. The mass on the perimeter and then a transparent core. This has, was trying to address many of those forces at play of the initial equation. One of them, of course, direct sun radiation and greenhouse effect. When you put the mass in the perimeter and avoid the sun hitting directly the glass and avoid the greenhouse effect, energy consumption drops from 120 to 40 kilowatts per square meter per year. So, if you're rigorous using common sense, you have solved 90% of the sustainability issue, sustainability issue of a given building in the environment of Santiago. If you're in a different latitude, it may be the opposite. But for Santiago, that was the case. But in addition to the energy consumption, when you have a core that is transparent, we, our, our office is in the 29th floor of an old tower from the 70s. 
we have been there for years, and I have no idea what the guy on the 13th or 15th floor is doing. You just miss that because you're circulating through an opaque core. And we thought that for innovation, for a knowledge exchange, for knowledge transfer, you need to see what others are doing. The moment you have an empty core, just by taking the elevator on your way to your office, you look at what others are doing. And that very informal uh, knowledge exchange is the start for who knows what, and that's at the very core of innovation. Finally, in a seismic environment like Santiago, you know, for us, gravity is irrelevant. I, I don't think of buildings vertically. For us, the force that matters is horizontal. It's much stronger, the acceleration of the ground. So the moment you put the mass in the perimeter, and anybody that has tested the tube, when you have the mass of a tube in the perimeter, it's much more resistant, it's more efficient, so you, you use less material. Actually, the walls of this 17,000 tons building is 25 centimeters thick. If it was of glass, it weighs also 17,000 tons. It's not that if, if it looks lighter, it's actually lighter. It weighs the same. But the matter is more efficient in this case to be placed on the perimeter. Again, in addition to that, in a context like Chile, we know nobody will maintain the building. So a building that has the structure in the perimeter, the building takes care of itself. And, and this is a, a, some of the strategies that with one operation, you're taking or addressing three or four uh, terms of the equation. Sorry, I'm going to move because otherwise over there you don't see. So you see here, we were grouping the floors. That was a degree of freedom so that you could see compression. The, the weight of the building is the way you perceive. It's very difficult to photograph this building because what matters here is the weight. So that is one case. Another recent project we're building in Lisbon, in Portugal, again, a latitude where sometimes you need thermal mass in the perimeter, but also you want to have a transparent uh, perimeter to gain natural light and avoid energy consumption in artificial lighting. So it's a mix or hybrid building. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of this building but that has a component of public space and another one of the, the question that I guess it's going on around the world nowadays regarding the working space. Should we even come back to the office? Why come back to the office after the pandemic? So these are the questions that are floating in the air and that we were trying to address. So our first uh, intuition for the project was to take care of a public space for the city that uh, any citizen for free can enjoy, pretty much like here, where the space in between the buildings is public. That was the attitude for a building that in principle could have been just one big block, well, for the master plan, so that we could guarantee the, fee, the free view of the river. We separated the volume in two, so there are thinner volumes, yet they're connected underneath. So that was our first intuition, and then on the perimeter, a more conventional office working space. This is how it looked maybe four or five months ago. And this is maybe another, another thing that we have been exploring. When the structure of the building is finished, the architecture is finished. In contemporary architecture, many times you put up the structure, beams, columns, slabs, and then the final appearance is just a skin that you put. Well, we, in order to last, in order to stand the test of time, not just culturally, but also physically, we more and more are developing strategies where the structure is the architecture. Once you finish the structure, the building is almost finished. So you see the, the images and then the situation on the construction. So this is what I was referring. The building is connected at the ground level through a vault so that it works even from the security point of view of one single entity, yet the space in between, the, the ground is kind of tilted 
so that you can connect at the public level of the sidewalk, of the city. But the important operation here was that the ultimate goal of this building and the master plan was to recover the view of the river that had been blocked by existing buildings. So by folding the ground, we had this cantilever stick that enabled you to go enough height in a public condition to regain the view of the river. It's a 14 meter long span, a canopy. So again, from the initial sketches and then the version a couple of months ago. So once you are up, this is Aires Mateus building uh, in front of the river. So we get some uh, public condition regaining the, the view. Uh, the third project I wanted to show is this uh, museum in Doha, in Qatar, the transformation of an old industrial facility into a cultural facility. I guess it's familiar uh, with this attitude that in addition to embedded energy, if, if energy was already spent, you want to keep it. So how many of the structures, which I, I it's, it's the right attitude here, you save the structures that already had spent energy it also adds to the identity, even if it's a very recent, it is history, you can't buy time. Uh, so this was um, an old port that is going to be transformed. The city is going to be open and touching the sea. Uh, and you see is the Museum Triangle, Ian Pei, Museum of Islamic Art, Jean Nouvel, the National Museum of Qatar, and then our project in the transformation that actually didn't start from scratch. It started, we took the existing silos as the DNA of the design. So this industrial facility that had these very impressive uh, design qualities for a different use, for, for the accumulation of grain, we thought it had some potential, not just for the use, but mainly for domesticating the environment. The environment in Qatar is extremely hard. Well, you may all know from the World Cup, they have to move it because otherwise it's too hot in July. So what we were thinking with the silos was to use them as a forest of columns, which is a very old strategy for how to domesticate the environment. You create shade without the roof, a hypostyle hall that actually comes from Karnak on. And we thought the silos offered us the, pos the possibility to conquer this uh, big space with a geographical operation. So. Yeah, this is, we, we it started again with some very intuitive sketches and very rough models that prove the point uh, until it becomes more developed, uh, which is what we naturally have to do. This is a project that will take maybe 10 to 15 years. So uh, it's important that the initial point is, is as clear as possible. The, the, this project, maybe as here today, but maybe it's an exception. We have been very lucky to have this incredible weather. In and, uh, desert countries like this, public spaces are used, at, are used at night. So the use after, the, not during the day, but at night, is where people go out. You see children until midnight in, in public spaces because of the heat. Uh, so the 24-7 the life of the building is, is very relevant and some of the operations that we are practicing uh, to the silos. And the last one regarding this more, let's say, conventional approach to architecture, you do buildings in the end, uh, is a, a competition that we recently won for the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland, in Basel, that, uh, well, for many years, we didn't win any competition. Uh, something happened, maybe because we begin to understand the question before jumping into the answer and, uh, and making the client agree with the question before jumping into the answer. Something begin to change. Uh, at least we were not eliminated in the first phase. Uh, we were going to go to the second phase and sometimes to become finalists. Uh, and in this building, as in Qatar, we were extremely surprised that we were, won. We had never done a museum. 
And, and maybe that's something that matters. We're, there's almost every single project that we've done, we know very little about it at the beginning, including social housing. We knew nothing about it. And we warned the client, look, we have never done a museum in, in Qatar. And they, they were okay with that because sometimes, not always, sometimes, if you're rigorous with your ignorance, you take nothing for granted. And you're careful with the decisions you take. So sometimes to be an outsider and, and ignorant is not that bad. We were extremely surprised in this one. The final shortlist was of 11, I think, uh, practices, and everybody was there. Norman Foster, heads of Demeron, Kengo Kuma, Cheaperfield, uh, Dominique Perrault. So, so it, and, 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 and it's not that we do buildings, uh, not, not, especially not a tower. Um, so again, we had nothing to lose. And then you maybe are more accurate with the, with the question, and also can risk a little bit more with the answer. Uh, here, the strategy uh, is also hybrid. Concrete every three floors, so that we use concrete for what it's good for. It's very inefficient to do a high-rise 110-meter hike in wood, even though from the footprint, the carbon footprint is desirable, but it's very inefficient. Concrete is very efficient for doing that. So the other two floors, two out of three floors, as of wood, in between these neighborhoods, which are also a, a space for socializing, which is actually the reason why we come back to the office, to meet others. Originally, I mean, all, all of you that have maybe had the uh, chance to work in office uh, buildings or institutional buildings, normally the briefs were given by the amount of desks that you had to put in the building. Well, now re desks are not that relevant because you can work from home. What matters is how many meeting spaces are you able to locate in the building. So the social dimension of buildings is becoming much more important uh, for, for uh, companies, for, for universities and institutions in general to move forward. So it's, a, it's in a place of, of uh, Basel that is a big, it's, it's been transformed lately. So, that regarding the more conventional architecture. With all those design operations that we have been trained, and actually, this is the highest possible design level, at least that we have been able to achieve. And when entering social housing, well, this is the skills that you are required. So, it's like we feel our tools were sharpened and our muscles were trained to be fit in order to go into the toughest of the questions. But some context may be required here. Social housing, when I say social housing, in here, I have something that may be very different from what you think whenever you hear social housing. Actually, if you Google social housing in English, this is what com comes out, at least in my algorithm. If you Google vivienda social in Spanish, this is what comes out. So it's already very telling of when we say scarcity of resources, we're on, on a different page here. And that's the set of constraints that we had to accept from the very beginning. Otherwise, nothing gets done. And this is maybe an, another important thing that you have to learn to live with the good enough. Your results are going not to be optimum. The optimums are going to be relative. Maybe better than having done nothing, but it's not absolutely great. And it is a very tough environment, and we were willing professionally to accept that challenge. So for us in Latin America, social housing is this. This underserved peripheries, where cities are accumulation of houses, not a concentration of opportunities, that, that in the end what is, is what the city is. People coming to cities because cities concentrate higher chances to have better access to jobs, to education, to healthcare, to transportation, and even leisure. But what the cities that we have created in Latin America is not opportunities. Underserved peripheries are just houses. So we may have addressed the housing crisis, but the problem that we created, we will we'll see in the third part, is even worse. So this is for us social housing. This is social housing. Two more context. We started from evidence and facts. 
that we, as an outsider, knowing very little about social housing, and actually out of embarrassment, I didn't know what a subsidy was in the year 2000 when I was invited to teach at Harvard. In a country that I found out at Harvard, where 60% of what gets built uses some kind of subsidy. And I didn't know what a subsidy was. So again, out of that ignorance and embarrassment, as an outsider, I began, but not, of course, just me, there was the merit of many people we met around. That's what Harvard has, you know, an in incredible intellectual capacity of bringing brilliant minds to address difficult issues. And I met there, uh, who ended up being my partner, a transport engineer, Andres Iacovelli, who was doing his master's at the Kennedy School of Government, so it was in the policy world. Um, also, he knew much more about housing than me that was supposed to be the architect, and the, the expert in the room. And among those facts, was that first, a middle class family can live reasonably well in around 80 square meters. So you have money, both individual family savings or as a country, fine, you can provide yourself with decent housing. But what if there's no money? Actually, the strategies in Latin America are twofold. You reduce and you displace. You build houses where land costs nothing and you make them small because the budget is not enough. Small to the point that actually, in the best of the cases, social housing, in, in if you're really lucky in Latin America, you can build around 40 square meters. The consequence is that family will make that unit grow, no matter what, it will happen anyhow, to double the initial size. So from the initial 40 of public funding, families will make that uh, small house grow. And our first reframing of the question was, if we accept that 40 square meters is a constraint, can we look at them not as a small house, but as half of that good, desirable one that unfortunately with public funding we cannot afford? So half of the good house instead of a small one. And the key question, so in, in other words, what we were doing is when you're dealing with scarcity, not having the money to do everything on day one, you create an incremental system that over time may be able to achieve the standard that you can't pay on day one. So incrementality as an antidote against scarcity. So the key question here is when you reframe the problem as half of a good house instead of a small one, the key question is, which half do you do? And the definition of a public policy is you take care with public funding of everything that a family cannot do well on their own. And we identified five design conditions that belong to the half that families can't improve over time. Number one, location. The key question in housing is not how much, how many square meters, how many finishing, is where. Where is it? especially when you have to buy into the private market, like is the case in Chile, well-located land that is integrated into the, into the opportunities that cities offer. Otherwise, you get the underserved peripheries with no access to opportunities. So, location, urban layout, structure for the final scenario, the more technically complex parts of middle-class DNA, those are the five design conditions that we identified as a consequence of framing the question in that way. The second thing that requires context is that in the developing world, and I'm talking about here two billion people in the world, in the poorest countries in the world, housing, prop, uh, housing policies are property oriented. When you get a subsidy, a vulnerable family becomes the owner of the house. So that's why housing for the majority of the population of the world is not just to design well a shelter against the, the environment, is the biggest transfer of public money into a family asset that that family will ever receive in their lifetime, and only once. And all of us, when buying a house, expect it to grow its value over time. Social housing is closer to buy cars than buying houses. The value goes down. And this is a disaster for public funding, but also for the family that could if well done, have the house as a, an economical tool 
to overcome poverty and not just as a shelter against the environment. So we identified five design conditions that can guarantee that that family asset over time can grow its value and behave as a social investment and not as a social expense. You may recognize that there are exactly the five that a family cannot do well on their own. Location, urban layout, structure for the final scenario, technically complex parts of the house, kitchen, bathroom, partition wall, fire resistant walls, and the middle class DNA. So with that in mind, and I'm talking about 2003, this project started 2000 and 2001 at Harvard. We had the opportunity to test some points we thought we have in a real project. And here, the approach of my partner and engineer was crucial because he said, whatever the point we have is, we have to accept every single constraint that is out there in the market because if we prove the market wrong, only then we may force them to change if we have any exceptions, they will blame on that exception not to keep on changing or improving the quality. So that first question was, can you provide a housing solution, solution for 100 families that have been living illegally in a half an hectare site in the center of the city, 5,000 square meters, using the public subsidy, $7,000 with which we had to buy the land provide the utilities and the infrastructure, and build a house. And that normally is distributed in thirds. So you have, in the end, $2,500 to build a house. That's why the best you can do is to build around 30 square meters. Can you do that? That was the challenge that we received from the Ministry of Housing in that first project in the north of Chile, in the desert. These were the living conditions in that, uh, that settlement. You see a labyrinth... Uh, configuration and footprint that was, of course, very uh, adequate for drug trafficking. They had a huge issue, issue with drugs, uh, traffic, and, and narcos uh, dominating the, the neighborhood. Um, one toilet for all the families. It's, uh, well, it's what I, what I saw here the first day uh, with the Roma settlement. Uh, how it's called? Vilkirit. Um, so it's very familiar in a way. It's, uh, you find the same situation uh, all over. The alternative, with that amount of money that allocates very little money in land, is that the, the cost of the land in the center of the city, in principle that, that neighborhood was somewhere there, you see the desert, we have 800 meter high uh, plateau, and then the land that can, social housing can afford is in the high plateau called Alto Hospicio, 16 kilometers away, uh, so no opportunities there. They have to commute back and forth to the city. It, again, is a social disaster once you begin to accumulate poor in the peripheries. And for $7,000, this is what, what the market was providing. So that was our uh, competition. Because we knew that at least half of the square meters were going to be built by the families, we thought the participatory process was a must. So out of pure practical reasons, knowing that the responsibles of half of the built area were going to be the families themselves, which is actually the case in slums, instead of resisting that capacity, we thought maybe we could channel that capacity into the design. But for that, we have to agree with the community what are the alternatives. Because with $7,000, the chances of families being disappointed is so high that you have to manage expectations or at least explain what it means to accept those constraints. So we did this exercise of going through the typologies existing in the, in the Ministry of Housing, where type A was the touch houses. You see that somewhere there in the image on the, on the right, there you see the roofs but it's, going, it's been surrounded by informal uh, construction because they doubled the initial size. So you have the same informal settlement, but it's not a minor thing, connected to sewage and water, but the quality is very bad in any case. The problem with this, case, this uh, thing here was that because of the density, only 32 families could be accommodated in the half an hectare site. 
That meant the social problem of who were the 70 families that were not being able to be accommodated there and will have to go to Alto Spicio. But even worse, if you put together the money of 32 families, we were not even being able to buy the land. We needed density to be able to, to pay for expensive land in the center of the city. So this was not an alternative. And this was very important because when you did the participatory process, every single family was expecting their dream house is a detached house. Anything that was not a detached house was going to be a disappointment. And this was very important to be proved. Who are the 70 that leave? But unfortunately, we can't buy the land. So we agree that that, that expectation will not, is not possible to be fulfilled. Test with alternative two. Typology where the size of the plot has been reduced to make it coincident with the size of the house, to make it coincident with the size of the room. This is a policy that accepts three meter wide houses. Our peripheries have hundreds of thousands of these units with well, three meter wide units. So whenever you have to add a room, and we knew we had to double the initial size, you either block bathrooms and kitchens, or you have to walk through a bedroom to, a bedroom to arrive to the new one. So what you get is overcrowding, not efficiency in the land use. Consequence, not an alternative either. Let's go high, typology C of the ministry, the building blocks. This was the only way we could fit 100 families. But the, the community threatened us to go to a hunger strike if we even dare to offer this as a solution because this is known for blocking expansions or the pressure for expansion is so high that structures are debilitated and when an earthquake enters the system, upper floors collapse on the ground floor. So if you don't anticipate the growth, all the deaths are going to be on your side. So this was not an alternative either. The conclusion of the participatory process was that we were, were going to have to come up with something that was in between a building and a house, not knowing exactly what. So, of course, Harvard, these brilliant people around trying to come up with some strategies. And when we arrived on the site, families had already arrived to the same conclusions that this, the brilliant minds at, at Harvard, which was initially there were not 100 families, there were just 50 of them. And they built on top of the initial house an apartment that they were renting to a second genera generation of illegal tenants. So the house was a source of income in a very well located part of the city. So our strategy of having a one property on top of the other to achieve enough density had already been spontaneously developed. And this is very important because participatory processes would do, among other things, is that they capture street wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom in, in the families, in people that have been dealing with scarcity all their life. So that's an asset, that's some, some, some we won't. When you have difficult questions, you need knowledge. And there's different type of knowledge. Some of them are professional, but some of them are just wise from life. And this was one of them. What they couldn't do is that individual actions cannot guarantee common good. So they begin to do on their own, but they cannot take care coordinatedly of what the space in between the individual actions. So maybe this is the role of the architect. What's not going to be built, not what's going to be built. So with that in mind, we went through workshops to make sure that we were on the same page with the, with the family leaders, asking them to draw um, what they were uh, understanding as, as these uh, design strategies for the courtyards or for the facades. And this is how they, they imagine uh, their houses were going to look like. And I would like you, in, in, the, in the end, if I don't recall, to talk about that satellite dish uh, there on top. Uh, because this is the kind of counterintuitive solutions or, or strategies that are relevant to capture knowledge. So, a house underneath 36 uh, square meters and duplex apartment on top 
each of the houses with individual access because if you have collective stairs, nobody takes care of them. This is individual responsibility in a collective courtyard. So that each house on top grows to the side and the house underneath to the void and to the backyard, achieving within the given structure 72 square meters. So, of course, that is more expensive than the, the box you saw at the very beginning. So, the second or another dimensions of the participatory design was to agree where we're going to take the money to pay for more expensive things like structure for the final scenario. Well, no finishings. Because finishings are relatively easy for a family to do on their own. So, they don't fall in the category of the first five. So, no floor, no painting, the walls that were expansion was going to happen made out of cardboard because then we knew if they can secure property and they were not going to be evicted, all the money that they may make immediately goes into the house. And of course, we would have never been able to custom design these solutions for every family. We would have never guessed this color or this finishing or the, or the... And this is where personal taste, identity, preferences come into the equation. This was not part of our initial strategy. It was just a, an involuntary side effect, but that proved very important in terms of dignity, in terms of appreciation with the household, the fact that they continue the process. The same thing with the duplex apartment. You see a void, so practically a double height. That was very soon, because no structural operations were performed, was completed. And again, maybe this is something for which at least I was not trained, which is to be okay to lose control. You start the process, but you don't control the final outcome. And it's okay, because they, 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 they tend to be so reasonable operations, and uh, they tend to, tend to add, and of course, uh, the final result. In the end, what matters is this. At the initial cost of $7,500 of subsidy, out of which, this is important, $300 are family saving, $7,200 is direct subsidy from the state. So for a family, it's $300. They took a couple of years for them to save. Now, if you go and try to buy one of those houses, it's $70,000. And one of the reasons is location. Of course, they're four blocks away from the beach and surrounded by schools and healthcare centers and everything. So that is a family asset that now allows them to be a citizen and not a weight for the state. So this is the, the, let's say, what we're always trying to solve. Dense enough projects to pay for expensive land in low rise so that when the situation goes wrong, no elevators have to be maintained, individual responsibility of, of elevated circulations. So low rise and dense enough to pay for expensive land without overcrowding with the possibility to double the initial size. If you solve that, you have more chances to be able to transform housing policies in, into a device that can channel and make people become part of the solution and not part of the problem. So this is another version of what I said before in the other buildings. When the structure is finished, the architecture is finished. If we were forced to, to say, OK, what can you keep on taking out? I would be absolutely comfortable with delivering this. If the structure is right, you see the three meter void to the side. Each of these apartments grow, grow to one side. But the partition wall is seismically resistant and prior proof. And these are the kind of things that family cannot do individually. We'll, I will show another image. Collective layout. Well, we thought we had a brilliant idea by placing all the units on the periphery and this, in the center, a football field. And in the, the, the uh, meeting with the families, we thought we were going to kill with this. That's going to be an absolute hit. Well, they say, no, we're not 100 families. We're just four groups. So divide them in smaller groups because that's the way social agreements can be maintained. If we have one big 100 families and entrances on two street sites, the drug dealers 
will have entrances from both sides. They will begin to copy the keys and we will not know who is who. In 100 family, you can't remember who is who or you can't know who is uh, related to. But when you go down to a size of between 20 to 30 families, this has been studied, this is started intuitively, then social agreements can be maintained over time. So that required from us to introduce in the binary structure of the urban fabric that normally has just private and public, the notion of the collective. So that individual, so let's say a collective group of families that can achieve some economies of scale. So for example, this is another project that we did in the south after the reconstruction of the earthquake, 8.8 uh, .8 Richter scale earthquake in 2010. This is a conventional periphery with the binary structure public that you see passages there. Uh, and this is the introduction with the same density of these collective spaces that belong to a group of families. What matters here, you see, that growth here is happening to the side. So it's pretty much the same form of that there, it's just back to back. And what does this produce? All the incentives are on the second mover. Because this guy here is waiting for this neighbor to build their expansion first. When that happens, the one wall, the, the partition wall, will be already built. So everybody is waiting for somebody to do their first move, and then they will continue. Of course, that wall won't be fireproof, won't be seismically resistant. So it's the kind of things that begin to put a threat on the growth process. But the moment you created a system where you're taking care of the, the void, then that expansion can ha happen fast, safe, and cheap. In addition to that, when you have this group, let, let me go backwards here. It's in Chile, it's hot in some, some of these spaces. If this family wants to have a pool, kind of minor, it's impossible. They cannot afford a pool. Not only they don't have the money, but they don't have the space in the house to put a pool. The, the courtyard is just too small. If they put the pool on the, on the passage there, the next morning it doesn't exist. But when you have a group of families, each of them putting a small amount of money so that among all of them, they pay for that pool, they can put it there because there's enough space, and the next morning exists because it's the group of family responsibility to look after that space. The same thing would happen with landscape, for which there's no public money or funding, where they will buy cars, they will put a fence, for example. So these are the kind of social agreements that are very relevant for a value gain over time of these complexes. So this is the different project in the south after earthquake, have 42 square meters that can expand to 84 within the structure that we provide, in this case in wood. It's not that families build the second half with their own hands. Once they become owners, and this is part of the participatory process, we train some local labor so that they sell the second half in a very efficient way, so they hire people. They do have money, but if they have the risk of being evicted, they never put money in the house. Once the, the property is secured, they channel their income uh, immediately into the house. So some, many projects in Chile, but also in Mexico, uh, we were trying to test the different strategies uh, and densities. And actually, the last one that is under construction, a, a thousand family project in, the, in a rather rich neighborhood of Santiago, where we needed even more density to achieve, to be able to pay the land. So a duplex underneath and a triplex apartment on top, each of them being able to achieve beyond 80 square meters, even though the initial surface within the void is around 40. So uh, when you, what you see is that when we built the first project in the north of Chile, and uh, we proved the marking that for the same money, something different could be done, then, of course, the, the stakeholders were saying, yeah, but in the north it doesn't rain. It's a different story in the south. So we went to the south, and the pitch roof is in a rainy part of the country. 
And then the excuse was, yeah, but that's a small town. So we went to Santiago, the metropolitan area, and built in the most expensive neighborhood because there is the workforce that is needed, and we were able to pay within the subsidy for expensive land. Then the excuse was, yeah, but those, all those lands are flat. What about the slopes? So we went to other projects with uh, other uh, sites with slope. The final excuse was the design architecture was too expensive. So here you have the, plan, the plans for free. Download them, and these are available on our website, the CAD files. Uh, so maybe the excuse will be another one, but you're making the, the market life more difficult with taking the possibility of excuses out. But actually, this is still within the formal policy. And the type of issues that we have in, in Latin America are, are much pressing, and, and slum upgrading is a, is a different a reality that has been growing in Chile. So what I'm going to show here is a video in a, in a pilot that we're doing with the Ministry of Housing, plus an NGO, plus the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB Lab, because there we may have the chance to achieve more scale in the, in the slum upgrading with this unit of basic services uh, for which we're, we're uh, trying to make some technical innovations. From emergency housing to the housing's emergency. Against the pandemic, Governments make a very simple recommendation. Stay at home and wash your hands. But what seems to be a no-brainer for many is something impossible for billions. The pandemic exposed the magnitude of the inequalities of our societies. The housing crisis is not only a question of poverty anymore, but literally a question of life and death. We have the challenge to fill this double gap, the sanitary and the social one. But the difficulty is the 3S menace. The scale, speed and scarcity of means with which we will have to overcome the housing deficit has no precedence in human history. Conventional procedures have been unable to respond to such challenge. So, what to do? When there's no time nor money to deliver everything on day one, use incremental design as an antidote against scarcities. An open system that, over time, can achieve the required standard that emergency and scarce resources prevent from happening. The prototype that we are testing starts with prefabricated, state-of-the-art piece of infrastructure that, in order to gain precious time, can work initially with off-the-grid basic services. Following a counterintuitive sequence, such structural but also legal frame takes care of everything that a family can do on their own. It is followed by an incremental sanitation, an incremental housing, and incremental urbanism. If we adhere to a participatory process, people will be part of the solution. In other words, against the 3S menace, the 3P Alliance, a coordinated action of public and private sector, can put in place the basics and channel people's own capacities, resources and preferences.
why does this matter? I guess that we have uh, learn the rough way in Chile, if you don't address these issues, and not only the housing crisis, but you create these underserved peripheries with no access to opportunities, the risk to create a ticking time bomb in the cities is very high. So in 2019, uh, October 2019, uh, it, it will be uh, this end of the month, 19th of, of October, um, what a raise of a couple of cents in the public transportation fee uh, created and triggered a huge social explosion that most of the Chilean population was not anticipating. Actually, the day after the raise, what is a kind of source of proud, pride in, in, the, in Chile, the, mainly the, the subway, the, the metro, was burned, stores were sacked and looted. Uh, it, we were on the fringe and the verge to, of, of a, a, a civil war on the streets. Uh, this, this level of anger and resentment, uh, we, we could see that in the peripheries, but may, most of the population was unaware of this because in addition to uh, inequalities, cities reflect them in a very brutal and daily way. In the case of Chile, even with segregation, you can make your entire life without even knowing that these underserved peripheries exist. So that led to the social explosion, but that was not the worst thing. What we realized and what we've been witnessing lately is, uh, well, actually this led to this, uh, the, the force of the explosion led to a questioning of all the rules of the game, of how we will live together, we are now rewriting our constitution because the words that you listened more during the social explosion was abuse and dignity. So capitalism and neoliberalism was blamed for being unable to create equal access to opportunities to everybody. Uh, and that was mainly the political discussion where for the first time in Chilean history, 80% of the people voted to change the constitution. Never, ever in the history of Chile, we had had such an agreement on anything. And here we had this. So that was 2020. A year later, when people were chosen democratically to rewrite the constitution, the text that was presented, two thirds of the population rejected the text. So we're going back and forth into the approving uh, not accepting, and, and we're still there. It's a very tough issue, but that still is somehow political. And the debate has been like this, you know, left versus right. So what do we do with that? Do we create opportunities and freedom? That was the system before. Well, the left will say, well, that doesn't guarantee common good. If you're conservative against all the problems, bring the police, repression, and then the left, just with goodwill, would like to change the situation that hasn't happened either. Uh, so we're still in this kind of polarized discussion of how to deal with what is by far even worse than this, which is that in those peripheries, and I'm going to show here and give a little bit of context, of a three minute except from a film by Alejandro González Iñárritu, the Mexican filmmaker, he did Birdman, that's called Bardo. In the minute 59, this is the best explanation and his words, he described this new species that has appeared in our peripheries where life value is close to zero, there's no fear to die, life expectation is in, in one of the neighborhoods that we're working for ma young males is 24, year, 24 years old. So you have nothing to lose. He calls them the walking bombs. And in this film, he, in a dialogue, it's a fictional film, but it's about a filmmaker, a documentary, documentary filmmaker that is interviewing, in the case of, of Mexico, a narco in jail. And that narco explained to this filmmaker what the situation of those peripheries is. And that's what we're witnessing more and more in Latin America, where the state has not arrived, the market has not arrived, and the rule of law in that let's say Mad Max environment has been replaced by the law of the jungle. What to do with that? Well, I may show, a, I, well, to, to, to really, I really, we really don't are, are clueless of how to move forward. We may have some hints, uh, 
But this is the this film I would like you to show because may, this may be very difficult for you to understand, but at least for us has been the best explanation I've ever found about what we're uh, witnessing to appearing in, in these peripheries. And I'm talking about quantity here. 30 to 40% of the population in Latin America lives in slums. So this is a parallel system that has created, which has uh, a scale and a critical mass that we haven't witnessed before due to this failure of the housing and city policies, not only housing policies, the non-city policies that we have created. So let's take a look at the film. Tú no tienes miedo. Miedo de qué? De morir. La muerte para ustedes es un drama cristiano. En una cama, por un ataque al corazón. Para nosotros es la comida diaria, tirados en la fosa común. Aquí en la cárcel, nadie puede entrar y matarme. Pero yo puedo mandarles matar a ustedes allá afuera. Yo era pobre, invisible. Ustedes me negaron atención durante décadas. Y ahora, los tengo agarrados de los huevos. <risa> Nosotros somos hombres bomba. En las villas miseria hay millones de hombres bomba. Estamos en el centro mismo de lo insoluble. Ya somos una nueva especie. Ya somos otros bichos diferentes a ustedes. ¿Qué debimos haber hecho? Ustedes los intelectuales. Se la pasan hablando de lucha de clases, de marginalidad. Y entonces llegamos nosotros. Tengan más propietarios, muy felices, muy explotados. Hay una tercera cosa creciendo ahí afuera, cultivándose en el barro, educándose en el más absoluto analfabetismo, escondido en los rincones de la ciudad. Está usted delante de una especie de pozo miseria. ¿Pero qué, qué es lo que cambió en las periferias? La nada. Ahora tenemos millones. Y ustedes son el estado quebrado gobernado por incompetentes. ¡Ah, bueno! ¿Me entiendes? Nosotros tenemos métodos ágiles de gestión. Y ustedes son lentos, burocráticos. Nosotros no mantenemos a la muerte. Ustedes mueren de miedo. Nosotros estamos bien armados. Ustedes tienen calibre 38. Nosotros estamos en el ataque. Ustedes a la defensa. Ustedes tienen la manía del humanismo. Nosotros somos crueles, sin piedad. Ustedes nos han transformado en superestars del crimen. Nosotros los tenemos de payasos. Nosotros somos ayudados por la población de las ciudades miseria. Por miedo o por amor. Ustedes son odiados. Ustedes son regionales, provincianos, nacionalistas, corruptos. Tenemos 50 millones de gringos adictos. Nuestras armas vienen de fuera. Del gabacho. Somos globales. Nosotros no nos olvidamos de ustedes. Son nuestros clientes. Ustedes no se olvidan de cuando pasa el susto de la violencia que provocamos. <laughs> so, uh, a project that we started some years ago, uh, just in, maybe intuitively th um, anticipating these new species in the peripheries, is uh, in Buenos Aires, in uh, Villa 31. It's a 50,000 people uh, slum in the center of the city, over there, the, the richest neighborhood in Buenos Aires, Recoleta. And the IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, uh, asked us to, and in a very bold move, they said, uh, yeah, we could build our, build our headquarters in the financial district of the city, but we would like to explore the possibility to build our headquarters in the middle of the slum. That was already very bold, uh, because that slum, it looks like this. And in the case of Argentina, it's five to six stories, so the original uh, occupants are, are uh, renting five times the cost of the land, because it's very well located in the city. It's uh, actually the highway from Aeroparque Airport to 9 de Julio, the main uh, uh, road in Buenos Aires. It's in the middle of there, uh, actually uh, below the highway. 
but with lots of not only houses, a lot of services that spontaneously begin to happen. So it has a double condition, no sewage, no water, yet a lot of economical life. And, and uh, the kind of, again, uh, things that people come to cities looking for, you can tell that the access to basic services, energy, for example, it's a, it's a brutal competition. So, uh, in the case of Villa 31, the problem is that the, all the access for these 50,000 people, half of them immigrants with no papers, so illegal, they want to be invisible to the society, as the guy on the video was describing, we were invisible to you, you let us grow in a different parallel universe. Uh, and now we don't have, have nothing to lose. They come in and out on not one single point over there, and within one hour, walking, because they cannot even afford public transportation, they have access to the jobs or, let's say, the opportunities that the city offer. They have these barriers like the highway, but mainly the train, all the trail tracks re separate them from the formal city where they are the workforce and for where for them the opportunities are. So the bank said, well, why don't you explore our headquarters in the slum? <clears throat> The only available space was that green space over there. It would have been a disaster if you arrive and the only open space in the slum was occupied by the bank. So we said, well, maybe we raise that. Uh, but in addition to gaining light, and that was conditions in Washington for how, how the security standards for the bank were, natural light and views. In addition, the, we could have saved the public space, but they needed roads to connect. There are no roads. So the city would have had to build roads where there's none, because the IDB in the, way, in, the, in the end works of having meetings and lending money to ministers, to governments, and they have to have physical meetings, going back to the question of why do we meet? Well, physical meetings in the bank, which in the middle of the slum was a, a threat. So also a pedestrian connection to the public transportation for the staff of the bank was required. So in the end, at least four conditions that the city had to fulfill in order to the bank to place their headquarters in there. Of course, that was a no-go, impossible that the city of Buenos Aires, that is already uh, lacking a lot of money, pays to a bank those these services and basic conditions. So our uh, counter-proposal for the bank was, what if the building is the four conditions that you are, at, are asking to the city, and make the building become a bridge that has one foot in the slum, another foot in the formal city. With that security solved on the conference center there to the right, public access to public transportation. Uh, and then the other end is on the slum. This project was developed up to the very, up to the very last detail. The engineers, the structural engineers were SBP, the same that we were working with in, in Qatar. They did the, the world stadiums, the, the cup stadiums, uh, their German, uh, German office. So they said, this is a 240 meter long building, uh, 110 meter span. And they said, no problem. For the span, no issue. The problem is the vibration. So we need weight. So we added the park on top as a solution for the vibration, which offered more public space in an environment where there was none. In addition, the bank was working in between the beam, but then they could allow the people to use the roof of the bank as a mean, uh, because if that happened, the situation, current situation that was within one hour walking, they have access to healthcare three, education, 100 and something, culture, 35, recreation, and let's say 300,000 jobs. If you create the shortcut with the bank, within the same hour walking, you multiply by four the chances of having access to jobs and take a look at all the indicators which are these opportunities that cities concentrate, to that from which the people were segregated. So uh, this project, again, as I was saying, uh, was developed uh, and actually had just one issue, minor issue. We had to change the law in the Congress of Argentina for the use of 
air rights. The rail tracks were federal government, so there was no precedent for that. And normally, in the city of Buenos Aires, the president and the mayor are of uh, contrary parties, so they block each other any initiative. And we had an opportunity in the Congress, and we submitted the project, and to everybody's surprise, instead of winning, they calculated the ones that we were working with, calculated that we could have a chance of winning the voting by three votes, 10 to 50, that was a proportion that was outraged. Uh, they accepted to the use of the air rights, so the project uh, finally got the green legal light uh, to move ahead. Um, but in the meantime, the president of the bank changed. Donald Trump appointed a new president of the bank and going against the tradition of the IDB, where normally the president had to be a Latin, the president of the bank that uh, originated the project was Colombian, so he was very aware of what the kind of operations that we had to perform, was for the first time by Trump replaced by a US citizen. Uh, okay, the guy is now out because of uh, sexual accusations of sexual abuse, uh, but still the project is, uh, is not going forward. But I just wanted to finish with this as a possibility, it's, it's stopped at the moment, but maybe these are the kind of strategies. And interestingly enough, uh, a bridge, I know Novi Sad won the possibility to be a cultural uh, capital of Europe by the metaphor of bridges, the bombing of the bridges, but also being able to create. If there's one key word that we will have to implement in order to address this issue, I would say it's integration. So I can't think of a better context to present the bridge to the city of the bridges. Thank you so much. Okay, before we start, if you have questions, I want to remind you that uh, you have maybe 15, 20 minutes to pass them along to your right side to the edges so the team from our production can collect them and then we're going to go with five questions. In the meantime, I'm going to use this opportunity to ask a few questions of my own. And uh, the other day, on Tuesday, we went to uh, Velikirit, which you mentioned tonight. And you also, most of your presentation was about social housing. And the way you um, became famous, so to speak, is through the social housing that you were kind of thrown into. And uh, the reason why it works so well with you, and we talked about it, is the participation. And this is the first question that I want to open with because in recent times there's a lot of talk about participation, especially in the domain of cultural policy and also in architecture. So uh, to me, um, it's a lot of talk, but a lot of talk for show. Not everyone truly does a participatory work, and you do. So what I wanted to ask you is how can you uh, do a participatory project within the field, which is architecture, that depends on the market. So can you...? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I would say that um, but first and foremost, it starts from evidence. It's a fact that people will double the initial size of the housing projects, so it's, it's more efficient to have them sitting on the table on day one so that we can split tasks. Um, once you do that, um, there, we started this process out of pure intuition, in a very amateur way, uh, just testing what common sense or, or could tell you. And uh, of course, the management of expectations was very important. Uh, for example, in the first meeting the, with the community, it was only about explaining the policy. So in the first dimension of participatory process is information and communication of constraints. It's not up to us, it's up to the system if things will not work the way you were expecting. And that 
informed decision, even if very, I mean, it's not an easy process. I mean, you're blamed for things that are not your fault, but I think it's very important to be uh, transparent and honest in the communication of the constraints. <laughs> Following that approach, uh, I, I said before, why do the process is, if you have scarce resources, you better, better make a very efficient use of them. So the process is not to ask the people what they want as an answer, is to identify what is the question. Otherwise, you may answer well the wrong question. And uh, the moment you identify what is the question, then you have more chances to have them be part of the solution and a part of the problem. We need also to channel their own resources and uh, their own wisdom, as I said before. But I would say that was crucial more than the content was the attitude. And by attitude, I mean one thing that you normally encounter in participatory processes, particularly with vulnerable population, is that it's a top-down, arrogant approach. I've studied in the university. I have a professional degree. You may not know how to write and read, so you just accept whatever I say, or the authority, whatever it is. That's one approach that I think it, it has very high chances to fail because of the constraints. But also, and that's maybe mainly coming from the right, that kind of top-down approach. <clears throat> but also the opposite, it's, it's very complicated. When the left, out of guilt, whatever people say, I'm going to go there and do that, that's very irresponsible. Because sometimes you, you know, professionally speaking, that you well, first of all, that you won't be able to do that, or it's going to be bad for the common good. So I guess that the attitude was to have an horizontal, horizontal conversation where I may know some things and people may know other ones. And in order to have an horizontal conversation, they may need, like what I saw here, I mean, we will come with something that you may not have been expecting, but also us have to be open to listen and, and uh, uh, receive things that we didn't know about. And then you have to be able to change. And for that, you don't have to have a problem or you don't need to feel threatened if you change, change because, well, that type of wisdom may prove you wrong. Ah, maybe now I, for, I, I talk about the satellite dish. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, again, the kind of counterintuitive prejudices we tend to have when looking at the approach, at the strict wisdom of people. When we did that process and that very early drawing from one of the family leaders, the comment from particularly a certain elite, uh, not necessarily a technical elite, even as a, at, a, at, a, at a social level, was to blame the poor that were so lost in their priorities that they may not have food, but have money for having a satellite dish in the house. How non-educated, how stupid are they? When the lady, the, the, the woman of the house was asked the same question, her answer was, if I don't have the best video game and PlayStation at home, my children will prefer to go to the narco in the corner because that's more attractive. So I need to create something that is sexier than the corner as a survival tool. So the satellite dish is a, is a question of life and death. If I don't offer inside the house something that is more attractive than the corner, then that child is lot, lost as a, as a narco soldier, and then that, that is far worse. And there's so many examples that are counterintuitive in, in that approach. And as a professional, you have to be open to go, or let's say, and learn whatever you thought you knew about some things, and at the same time, be confident about the knowledge you have. Don't be, don't feeling guilty for knowing technical things that might be better for the families, and to say no sometimes. Thank you. Um, another question I wanted to ask you, and we are here in the district, and you walked around it today, and you finished your presentation with uh, the slogan of Novi Sad for new bridges. Uh, and this place is one of the legacy projects 
of the project of European Capital of Culture. But one thing is to build the building. And another thing is to live it. And the projects that you worked on, the social housing, you, you build them within the first one. I'm, I'm talking about uh, Quintam uh, Monroe. So, so it was the, the first one and it was built, it started in 2001 and you finished it in 2003. And then you kept going there to see how the life evolved in those buildings. So what, like, this place here is also now in the baby steps, in the first steps of this life that is about to come here. So what, uh, what does breed life into a building? Because it can just remain a shell. It's not enough to build it. It could be just a shell or it could be just wishful thinking. If you just say, oh, let's empower people and allow them to take over the place. Well, that, that happens naturally in informal settlements and individual actions, even if well-intentioned, cannot guarantee common good. So also just allowing people to do on their own is not a solution either. So it's a balance between losing control and letting go and understanding that you're not delivering a product, that is what I was trying as an architect, but you're starting a process and then you leave it on your own. But for that, you have to create very clear conditions for how things will happen. Of course, in participatory processes, we have a, a folder with all the plans and, and ask families, okay, you may follow this. The, the final scenario is already approved in the municipality and you ask them, are we on the same page? And they may not and you know they're not getting a thing because they're not knowing how to read plans, but they're ashamed to recognize that. So what we do in the end is we follow the minimum effort law. You put yourself in the situation of that person and you have a three meter void. What's the easiest and cheapest and fastest way to cover that span? The size of the void, the void is a design operation. We could have made it 2.8, but in 2.8, you can't have a queen size bed and a closet inside. Also, wood is sold in three meters, steel is sold in six meters, you cut it in half, and, and then you have to lose endings of, of the material. When, because air is free, we could have done 3.2, so in principle a better standard. But in 3.2 you have to create a joint that is technically very complicated, or when you cut the steel beam, you have a leftover that you can't use. So three meters is the size in which you have a room in which we will live, and that's the ultimate test, would I live here? A three by three room is where I was raised. So it's more than technical, it's something where you test if it's uh, universal enough. And the precision in what you're not building is fundamental so that when families go there to your design and knock on the, on the structure and they understand that's safe, then it's, very, it's more likely that they, that will happen that way. So I would say that you anticipate the worst case scenario or as I said, the minimum effort law and that has more chances for you to let go knowing that all those individual operations are going to be channeled in one direction and not just crossing your fingers that things will evolve properly. And also, uh, I would like to refer to one thing that you said in one of your interviews when you were talking about the forces, uh, the horizontal uh, that are very important, especially in Chile, the vertical, etc. Et and you talked about shaking the building literally and figuratively, and I would like to ask you, when you shake the building, all the access falls off. So what, what, is, what does remain when you shake the building? What is the core architecture and what is elemental, which is also the name of your firm? Well, it depends on the, on the project. Uh, you're right, the name in Spanish, elemental, is something, something that cannot be further decomposed. It's irreducible. If you keep on taking things out, then you lose quality. But it's just that moment before you begin to have losses instead of gains. Normally an earthquake does that. I mean, if an earthquake hits here, you will immediately, you know, decoration will fall out. 
arbitrary taste decisions will fall out, it's very likely that the structure will stay. So structure matters. That's why we're, we're more and more trying to make our designs when it's the case, so that the structure is the architecture. But there are other cases where after shaking the project, what remains is an intangible dimension of the project. It's a symbolic value. And maybe that's along the lines of, of more the architecture that we were trained for. But it's not always, that's the thing. Sometimes it's symbolic, not always symbolic. In the project for the Mapuche community in the, in the south, where there's a, a conflict, the two cosmologies, or two vis visions of reality, that are going in, in pulling in opposite directions. And for decades, the state arrives with understanding that they're impoverished communities, so they arrive with economical tools. I don't know exactly how it happened. This is one of the, the projects that I have less clue, or let's say where intuition was at the core of the operation, and what we call in the office the unspeakable certainties. You know the thing, that you have to, to do it that way, but you can't explain it with words. You just know it. And this particular case required from our side to come up with a symbolic operation. Actually to the point that we brought this kind of crown of wood trees or posts uh, to make the foundational act of a kind of Mapuche city, even though there was a, there had never been a Mapuche city, but we had to make something as, as if it had always been there. In principle, what we were trying is to create a space for peace conversations. They had this figure for, for negotiating peace with the Inca Empire, with the Spanish crown, and then with Chile that were called the Parlis, but they had no physical expression. So we thought, why don't we build a place for the parties where peace conversations can take place, but that can also work as a foundational act for, for a city that can uh, integrate different uses and that can level the field of mutual knowledge. What they asked was com a complete different thing from that. Actually, when we arrived to the first meeting, we were really scared because we were very conscious that it had nothing to do with what they were expecting. But when we unveiled the model, it was a small model like that, and you could tell from the faces that it was, they were a little bit in shock. They say, we don't know what it is, but that's it. And this project, if you ask me, what, what, after shaking it, what is left there? It's, it's not even symbolic, actually the, uh, the pivotal moment, I mean, it was, re I mean, I remember of the thing and, and, uh, and I guess these goosebumps, and <clears throat> we thought it was this kind of symbolic operation. For the Mapuche, dreaming is very important. The, the, let's say, answers to some challenges are revealed in their cosmology through dreams. And in one of the meetings, this old leader, and we were dealing with the, with the old uh, uh, leaders of the community, 80 communities around this project. Uh, he said, you know, I had a dream. And in the dream, I remembered a story that I had forgotten that was transferred to me. This is an oral culture, it's not a written culture. And uh, I forgot we had this. The name of the place that we were working is Loncoche. For ma ma Mapuche, Che is people, Mapu, earth. So it's the people of the earth. Loncoche, Lonco is head. So in principle, when you say Loncoche, you think you're referring that out of that territory, a lot of very important people, head of their communities, have come out and they're known actually for having generated many political leaders. But in the dream, he said, I remember a, to a story that was told by my grandfather to my grandfather, that the name came from, at some point during the war, or the pacification of the, the land, they were gathered, the leaders were gathered, and they cut their heads. And the heads were put on top of sticks. And what you brought here is a memorial for those that died in that moment that we had forgotten. So how can you possibly know that you were doing something that even them had forgotten? So you shake that, that project and what it remains is intangible.
it's, it's a memory or a dream. So it is very different depending on, on the nature of the forces that you identify. That's why that initial process where you throw everything and don't try to uh, distill it in advance. You put everything that you may consider may be relevant pro for the project, even if it's contradictory. But then the design may be able to negotiate. It's not clear. That, but you make sure at the very beginning that you put yourself in, in, the, in a very challenging scenario so that you don't leave out things that may be just a comment on the side, a fear, envy, uh, or a, a strong desire, whatever it is. And then I would say that that is part of what will be the DNA of that design. So it's like a toolkit. It's a it's a toolkit as an equation, not because it's scientific, but because it makes easier to verify if you're doing better or worse with your designs. There is a very clear way to environmentally speaking, better or worse than having done this way or that way. So it, the terms of the equation are clear. The answer is not a single answer; it's one possible answer. And sometimes it's intangible, so it's hard to prove. But it, it, it reality, in the end, either works or don't. Okay, so on, in line with this, uh, whether it works or it doesn't, um, you, you call your practice a do thank, and so it's trial and error, I, I suppose. And I would like to know, um, we learn most from our mistakes, so what would be the one single mistake in your professional career that you think that you learn the most from? <laughs> we can skip this question. You know, <clears throat> normally in the in innovators environment, it's kind of uh, uh, even a cliche that don't be afraid to fail, you know, or fail fast, fail cheap, so that then you can improve. Uh, but maybe that's fine when you're dealing with your own money. But what if you're dealing with a subsidy of a family that they will get only once? They don't have a second chance for you to make mistakes. So that's why the construction of the question is so important. And I would say that in our design process, to be as brutal as possible with ourselves is very... So the mistakes are made before going out into the reality because we cannot afford, or it's not fair, particularly in social housing, uh, um, to fail there in reality. So I would say that we are very careful to distill in advance uh, and not make mistakes afterwards. So I, I think we have, have very little room uh, and the, the decisions are not that many. I mean, you're, you have so many constraints that the, the, the degrees of freedom are very little. Uh, but more than mistakes, I would say that we have had to learn to live with the good enough. None of your solutions is optimum. It's relatively better than having done nothing. And that, of course, is a huge uh, open source of criticism that we get a lot. Uh, but if you know that, that having done that is better than having done nothing, uh, you, you keep on, on doing. In terms of mistakes, um, even though it was not our fault, but it, if we felt it was our responsibility, there was one project in the city on the coast, on the Pacific Ocean, uh, where during a storm, all the roofs were uh, were blown away by the wind, 120 kilometers wind, and of course that is a disaster. As soon as you you somebody calls you that the roofs of some of those uh, houses were uh, taken out by the uh, the tempest, uh, I mean you you your entire body reacts uh, with a with a very uncomfortable uh, move, and actually we we tend to think that in order to work in this. Uh, context, you have to grow a thick skin. Well, that's a disaster because you need a thin skin to get from people uh, what are the, the expectations, what are their fears, what are their, their desires. So you, you have to keep a thin skin to work in a very tough environment. So when 
shit hits the fan, then it hurts. Of course, when we went there, for some reasons that I'm not going to uh, go into too much detail, but it was strange that everybody was talking about design failure. Design failure, I mean, how can people know this term of a design flaw? And of course, we, we felt very worried, I'm actually legally worried we, that uh, there were some legal actions eventually being taken against us. Um, and we uh, asked some engineers to test our designs to see, let's say, they were blaming on the slope of the roof, that because it was like that, then it worked as a wing, and because of it was a wing, it was taken out. We made the, the design go into a wind tunnel, and actually it proved that the angle of that roof was the best that could have possi been have possibly done the, the, because of the orientation. And the ultimate failure was that the building company, you know, the entire system is so fragile that you have to work with the one building company that was open to go to the bidding process. Otherwise, you have to declare your bidding process, you know, empty, no, but nothing gets built. So you have to accept to work with somebody that is very fragile and always on the verge of going bankrupt. And of course, they had half of the nails that the roof had to have, so it's not our fault, but it's your responsibility. And in order to prevent that, we keep on adding security scenarios that, that being brutal with ourselves in advance because we know how much it hurts. I like that you use the word uh, responsibility because I think uh, not many people use it. Everybody's talking about their rights, but not the responsibility for their actions. So, so that's great. We have our questions, but before we go and dive into them, I want to ask you one final question. Um, when you decided, well, when you were in high school before studying architecture, uh, I find this very interesting. Um, you had to put three things, to list three things that you would want to study. And you put architecture first, and then you put dance the second, and then you put the flute as the third option. And you said that you didn't know how to dance, and that you didn't know how to play the flute, so architecture was an option. And for you, like for me as well, it was a why not moment. And you went on a journey, and here we are, and thank God that you did. Um, and what I wanted to ask you that on that journey, you must have been influenced by some, I'm not saying architects, because you also, you learned about architecture from photos and books, and you told me that to go and see good architecture, you don't see it in Chile, you go to Peru. So um, what were your, influences and I'm asking you this because this year's uh, Kaleidoscope slogan is unbreakable bonds that refers to the the influences and the dialogues between artists so what is your unbreakable bond that that anecdote is, is another way to say that it was not architecture I had no other plan I mean I don't dance I don't play the flute so it was just to fill up the the, the things not to to submit one thing even though I had no clue what architecture was. So, uh, so I put architecture for, for the why not, uh, which is actually maybe not that bad because you're not having to unlearn anything. You already know nothing, so you can, the only way is up from there. Uh, and in that process, I would say at the university, last five years from 85 to 91, the last five years of the dictatorship, uh, I had two types of professors, uh, the, the masters, or, and, and of course I've always been so thankful of Fernando Perez, he was my, my professor in the first year in, in workshop and in history of architecture, uh, because he is a high caliber intellectual, uh, and one of the things he was interested in to trespass to the, his students was think carefully. The moment you begin to think, your thoughts are going to be public, even if you don't want to. So better be careful with your thoughts. Of course, the, the intellectual itinerary, who to pay attention to, uh, van der Lan, the monk, that 
after in life I went, I found out that very very few people know about. But for him, he was a very important name in the education. Or Louis Kahn, or Vitruvius, or Boulet, or Palladio, whoever that was. Of course, I was studying architecture, uh, looking at the photocopies of these books. Not even the books, the photocopies of the books. Just uh, like me. And um, so the the first thing I did when I had the chance to travel, and it was to Italy, I arrived there, and one another professor that I, I appreciated very much, Ries, Hernan Riesco, he said, be careful, because it's like you've been uh, studying on a hunger strike. And all of a sudden, you're going to arrive in, in Europe, and it's going to be a banquet. If you eat all of that, you're going to collapse, so make sure that you're eating that feast in small doses. So take your sketchbook, draw, and take your measuring tape and measure the buildings. So for a year, I was measuring buildings. Uh, and that was another uh, professor, the, the buildings themselves. The moment you begin to measure, you walk in reverse the chain of decisions that somebody in front of the blank page has to have. Inevitably, you have to decide the this, this distance between columns, the material, the shape, the proportion of a room. So the moment you measure, uh, you begin to discover a huge amount of things that just the eye, not to mention the photograph, that you completely miss. So masters as people that at buildings were important, but as important as them were all the bad professors I had in the university. And uh, I'm thankful to them because at that age, you want to prove them wrong no matter what they say. And that, again, if you want to be serious in being rebellious, then you have to make your homework. And if you want to prove the professor wrong, you better study and be sure about what you're to co how you're going to contradict your professors. And that again trains your thinking process in a rigorous way that in the end, I, I guess it, it proved to be useful when uh, professionally working, you have to go in, in a direction that, that maybe the mainstream is not going, then you're, you're well already trained. It's like, like uh, you know, swimming in the Nat Danube here, that you're against the stream, that you better prepare your training uh, rigorously to contradict uh, when things doesn't make sense. So the first question, I like this one. Um, how do you like architecture and urban planning in SF movies? Sometimes it seems like concept artists for movies show greater respect to culture, race, and uh, space, or spe uh, I'm not sure what this is, than architects, but you get the Yeah, um, well, if I was not an architect now, and not at the time I was writing dance and flute, uh, but if, if, if now I would write down, maybe before architecture, uh, filmmaking. Um, and the reason is, uh, Maybe this is something uh, we learned during the Venice Biennale, when we created the Venice Biennale. The president at the time, Paolo Baratta, said that there are many ways to acquire knowledge. Intellectual, mental, uh, so you study. But in exhibitions, you acquire knowledge through emotions. The emotions are the mean through which you go into fields that are unknown to you. So experience. Uh, or em what emotions trigger, fix in your system much stronger than intellectually. And what filmmaking has is the storytelling capacity. The moment you create a narrative, and maybe because of the visuals, maybe because of the music, you get moved by the movies. And whatever you have there as a content goes into your system in a much faster way than whatever you can do as an architect. So if you want to take, change culture, change values, what do we do with the, as an alternative narrative to the narco soldier, to the kids that had no future? Well, 
role models matter. Maybe sportsmen are very important, and it's very important who the media pick up as role model. For sure, Sadio Mane, and not Cristiano Ronaldo. Why do you need 50 cars or 100 cars? Can't you do something else with your money? So if somebody tells the story of Mane, number two in Ballon d'Or, I think it's much more important as a narrative, and that's a capacity that the filmmaker has. What is the system of values that we can create as a shared collective purpose? I think that's what we're missing. And uh, let's say Netflix, I don't know the, the case here, uh, at least in, in Chile not long ago, uh, Meet and Express went into the, the choices. Uh, maybe you are, some of them are too young, but I remember traveling to Turkey by train coming from South America. So my only reference was Midnight Express. And I was afraid to death. What if I'm caught, even though I'm carrying nothing, with drugs and I end up in a jail in Turkey? That movie may have made much more against drug, drug trafficking than all the policies or repression that you can imagine. So, or Jesus of Montreal for uh, donating organs. So there are so many examples where I guess that the movies are able to create that emotional shared collective purpose that uh, I think is today in many places at risk. Thank you. Another question. How can we transform alternative cultural space without kicking out alternative artists that occupied space if they think that uh, transformation will endanger their art, jobs, etc. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable in what alternative means uh, or alternative art. Uh, but again, if I go back to uh, things I mentioned, and I don't know if here on the interviews now <laughs> I'm confused. It's uh, the way that has worked for me is to balance being as nerd as possible with being rebellious, rigorously rebellious. And I guess alternative is that attitude where you fight the cliches. The war against the cliché, I think, is very important. But you have to fight that war with a very rigorous, nerdy study of what's your subject and what's your matter. So the importance of alternative, even if it's, uh, it puts a threat on the business as usual or on uh, the system, is that you have to be convinced that you're being rebellious, not for the sake of being rebellious. That's a tantrum. That's what children do. If you're an adult being rebellious, then there must be a reason why you see that an alternative path is a better way to achieve a common good than just following business as usual. Otherwise, I, 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 it's fine that alternative is evicted if it's just for the sake of being uh, rebellious. Uh, the next one is signed. Uh, it's by Mariana. Uh, and she wants to know uh, the following. With regard to your comments about having freedom with architectural design in Chile versus in Europe, do you think we need more restrictions in city planning or more liberation on a global scale? We need more clarity. Uh, the moment you have clear rules, then you can be confident that uh, common sense will take over and things uh, will, uh, yeah, you, it's okay to lose control. So planning is about setting the frame, not, so let's say the starting point, not the outcome. Uh, and for that, strategic f form making, it, it's something that we naturally know how to do as, as architects. So um, the question of, of freedom, I, I would say, it's, um, it's always a question that we're, we're trying to calibr calibrate very uh, carefully. And it depends, again, on the nature of the question. When we're doing the bank in Switzerland, uh, 10 years for, this, for that project, we will have to be responsible to the last screw. Nothing can be out of our control, and you're expected to be uh, defining every single detail up to the very end. But in that context, it makes sense. You're expected to do so. But in other cases, 
it's about understanding how you will channel and, and, and let go. Uh, so more, more than planning or not planning, I, I would say it's, again, carefully paying attention uh, to the forces at play. When, one thing, I, it's not exactly freedom, but connected to, the, to Chile, and we were talking about this uh, uh, the other day, at least in Chile, we feel, we normally feel, that we are so far away in the corner of the world that we always wish that Chile was not in the periphery and we could be doing what the centers of cultural production of the world are doing too. To prove them, look here in the corner of the world, we are also modern and we are also postmodern or we are also deconstructivist, but of course with lower budget and it's normally a very sad uh, version of what is being produced in the in the center of the world with all the resources. Uh, but I remember it was a very conscious decision once I left Harvard and going to Chile, the question we ask ourselves, what can we do here? What are our degrees of freedom in the corner of the world that the first world cannot do even if they want to? So for example, in Switzerland, a guy, well, no, it's even worse than Switzerland, the US. <laughs> the first project we, I did outside Chile was this university dorms in, the, in Texas, in Austin, uh, for a university. And their design and architectural practice is guided by the fear of being sued by lawyers. So, uh, you do your design, and then after a while, you begin to see a huge amount of handrails that begin to appear everywhere because everybody's afraid that if somebody falls, it, they're going to be sued. Nobody takes responsibility out of that. Of course, you go to Venice, no canal has a handrail. Uh, we were in the fort in, uh, in Belgrade, no handrail. I mean, children on the, and parents, you know, saying to the children, you know, be careful, pay attention, don't be stupid, be responsible of your actions. Uh, so I guess uh, that is something that you're, you're required to do in Chile, but the, the real thinking there was, what can I do here that uh, somebody in the US will only dream of. So I can do projects without a handrail. <laughs> and that looks so radical, so pure, so honest, that if you, again, that is something where you can feel proud that you are there instead of the other way around. They wish they could do that. Or, you know, exposed concrete. The, the law in the UA, uh, you, uh, EU, I mean, it's, it's with the, the sustainability issues. Well, there, out of the earthquake and the resistance, you do a stone that will age over time. The structure is the architecture. That's a luxury I have. So I guess that the question of understanding the degrees of freedom, so going back to the question of freedom, more than planning, is identifying what is something that you and only you can do, that the rest can't do, and this may require some uh, alternative path, going back to the previous question. So when you shake the building, the handrails fall off immediately? They're, they're not handrails. Um, the last question is also one I wanted to ask you, but we are running out of time, is one that refers to uh, overstepping creative crisis. Where do you find inspiration? And I think it, it's also, can, it's a, they want to know uh, that you give them a piece of advice for your architects, but also I think this is also about the fear of the blank page, that every creator, whether it be an architect or a composer, designer, writer, whatever, uh, face at the beginning of a project. So how do you overstep a creative crisis? I would, would refer again to the balance between nerd and, and rebellious. Uh, the more nerd you are, the more tools are in your box. If you just have one tool, let's say a hammer, every single problem looks like a nail. And then whatever it is you are asked, you respond because of that. Or let's say if you have a creative agenda or you have a style, no matter how you are asked, you respond the same way. Building a, a large toolbox, which is the nerdy part of the profession, is to try to learn from as many uh, sources as possible so that when you're asked something, 
you pick up the pertinent tool, the one that is most the case for that given problem. And for that, of course, the more tools you have, the more you train your operations how to use those tools, the more chances you have to be pertinent. But it's impossible not to face the bank page with that jump into the void. Because you can build all the equations that you want, all the forces, identify all the forces that you want, and in the end, what do you do with that? I would say it's still a mystery. Uh, Italo Calvino says that an expert is somebody that in a given field can tell you exactly what not to do. But what do you do? And that's the, very, the biggest difference between a consultant and an author. A consultant is called to explain the decision makers all the threats or the advantages there is in a decision, but the decision has to be made by the client. An author has to take the risk and take the decision for the client. And is on your side if you, you jump into the void and fail. The thing I would say is that, of course, you iterate. Uh, the moment you have a clear uh, terms and forces identified, well, you just throw what if. The what if, I would say, is important. What if this? What if that? And of course you can fail. So what? But you fail before building it. That's the thing. You are brutal. Uh, and I would say to be mean and to bully our own designs is something that is very common in our practice. Uh, but we have created a certain intimacy in our, in our office so that when you are mean, you know it's not personal. The other thing that may be important in our practice uh, is humor. We make a lot of fun out of our, our own designs. So when we bully our designs, when they go into reality, reality is very mild compared to what we have done to the designs inside the office. Uh, so I would say that, um, again, if you are um, create the large enough tool of, toolbox, if you are uh, willing to uh, identify something that is something that you have not done before, so you are vulnerable again and you are not on the safe side, and then you can look at your own things with enough distance to, f to judge that what you did was just bullshit and then throw it away and then start again, then I would say that uh, it's a very healthy starting point uh, for, uh, for an architectural practice. So be fearless and be rebellious and nerdy as much as possible. And also have a lot of fear to fail so that you make sure that you do your job in advance. When speaking about art, I want to just use this opportunity because uh, there is a lot of people here and we have four exhibitions opened. So I would urge you to stroll around the district, meet it and see the exhibitions that are taking place. And before we finish, I just want to ask you one final question. Um, I, I wanted to ask you what is next for Aravena, but I'm not gonna, I'm gonna rephrase that. What is most urgent for Aravena now, looking into the future? Find the solution for the crisis of that was represented in the film uh, to that Mad Max world where the value of life has changed completely. Uh, but it's interesting because it's not necessarily that the va life has no value. And it goes maybe to the question of redefining the, the problem. The life as we know, let's say having a pulse or breathing, uh, it doesn't make any sense. But what really matters in that world are other categories. So on the one hand, they're merciless. I mean, the guy was saying, I mean, they're cruel. I mean, the way people get killed in these peripheries is brutal. I mean, it's, it's really mean. At the same time, one would say, well, these are animals. But the codes that they follow, let's say the importance of pride or loyalty. There, I mean, this is expressed not just for as an arco soldier, but let's say in a football ultra, uh, where if somebody steals the flag, they're willing to go there and die for that, so the value is connected to honor. So at the same time, it's very brutal, 
and very sophisticated. Uh, how to deal with that? I think we, we, we have to create new understandings, new rules of the game uh, for these new versions of where the value of life is. Uh, and of course, given architecture is about giving form to the places where people live. It's not more complicated than that, but also not easier than that. Giving form to the places where people live. What is life? If that has been redefined, I guess that we will have to redefine our responses to that accordingly. Thank you so much for especially saying yes to her proposal, to coming to Novi Sad, to Kaleidoscope, and this was your first time in the region, and I hope that in the coming years, you're gonna see you more often here. Thank you so much. Thank you.